In our last lecture, you will remember, we dealt with the creation, and now we will consider specifically Edwards' view of the creation of man and man and his nature. But I also want to take a glancing moment, at least, with the creation and fall of the angels, about which Edwards had a great deal uh, to say. One point I will make is that though the elect angels stood, it was nevertheless only, according to Edwards, by Jesus Christ the Savior, that the elect angels did stand. He writes, herein Christ was the Savior of the elect angels. For though he did not save them as he did elect men, from the ruin they had already deserved and were condemned to, and the miserable state they were already in, yet he saved them from eternal destruction, that they were in great danger of, and otherwise would have fallen into with the other angels. The elect angels joined with him the glorious Michael, as their captain, while the other angels hearkened to Lucifer and joined with him. And then was that literally true that was fulfilled afterwards, Revelation 12, when there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and prevailed not. Somewhat more catechetically, Edwards puts the question and gives a sevenfold answer how far the elect angels are dependent on Christ for eternal life. First, the work of redemption is their end. Second, their test was to obey Christ in this work. Third, this was especially so in the angel's attendance on Christ in his suffering. Fourth, Christ is the judge of angels that gives them their reward of eternal life. Fifth, they are the more closely related to Christ by his incarnation. Sixth, Christ is the one through whom they enjoy eternal life. And seventh, as the perfections of God are manifested to all creatures, both men and angels, by the fruits of those perfections, that is, by God's works, so the glorious angels have the greatest manifestations of the glory of God by what they see in the work of man's redemption, and especially in the death and sufferings of Christ. Now, the angel, Lucifer, who led the rebellion that brought the non-elect angels who were enabled to stand by Jesus Christ rather than having been redeemed after fallen, that Lucifer, who becomes the devil, is discussed in great length. One Edwardsian scholar feels that uh, Edwards had an almost demoniacal attraction to the subject. He does say a great deal about the devil, but so does the Bible. Uh, we've already noticed that Edwards preached the whole Bible, and everything that was revealed there was revealed in the preaching and the writing of Jonathan Edwards, and since the devil plays such a crucial role in the Bible, it shouldn't have surprised anybody that he was given special scrutinizing attention by Jonathan Edwards. He says that with respect to his fellow devils, it appears that Satan is an absolute monarch, the boss of the underworld. Satan, says Edwards, is more frequently spoken of in Scripture than devils spoken of in the plural number as though he were more than all the rest. 
His strength and subtlety are very great indeed, so much superior to the rest that he maintains a dominion over them and is able to govern and manage them, and they dare not raise rebellion against him, agreeable to Job 41.25. All the rest of the devils are his servants, his wretched slaves. They are spoken of in Matthew 25.41 as his possession. There's also a demoniacal possession of men. According to Edwards, those who neglect salvation under warnings are in a way that tends to great hardening of witchcraft. Once men become magicians and witches, they are less likely to give up their trade because they are more under the power of Satan. Christ, of course, delivered some from bodily possession by devils and also from possession of the soul, which was greater, which soul deliverances have continued after miraculous bodily deliverances have ceased. There are different ways of bodily possession, dumb devils, spirit of infirmity, etc. The same is true of mental possession, pride, maliciousness, drunkenness, uncleanness. But notice that uh, Edwards is careful not to suggest that these particular symptoms are necessarily indicative of demoniacal possession, but that demoniacal possession may manifest itself in these very familiar forms. He did believe that miracles ceased with the apostolic age, so the ability of human beings to discern the possession of a human being by a devil passed away with that miraculous gift, but it does not imply that such possession ceased to be. There seems to have been a special ordering of providence that accounts for so many being possessed at the time of Christ. It made his messianic glory appear all the brighter. Exorcism was Christ's greatest victory over devils. Can't help noticing that in Edwards uh, with an aside to the end of the 20th century in which almost every evangelical who walks down the road is likely to claim the ability to exercise devils. While the devil possesses the bodies of few men, nevertheless controls all souls of unredeemed men, says Edwards. Wicked men are the children of the devil, is the title of one of his sermons. Satan naturally dwells in the hearts of fallen men. Indeed, the whole world is like the man possessed by the devil. Edwards shows in the sermon on Luke 8, 26, how the devil does work in the hearts of sinners is explained. For example, men in this world fear the judgment of God and hope that there will not be another world in which that judgment occurs. When such wishful thinking occurs and men entertain such foolish ideas, quote, the devil sets in to enforce them. So if any of you hearers are disposed to that, Edwards is suggesting that the devil will second your motions in that wicked direction. Although the devil is a cruel master, men bear his image. Nonetheless, they pride themselves on their freedom while being his slaves all the while. But it is not the men whom the serpent does control, but those whom he does not, who interest him most and bring forth his greatest efforts to seduce. First, it is clear, according to Edwards, that the converted are released from the overpowering control of Satan. That does not imply, however, that he cannot profoundly affect the saints even to the point of their gross denial of Jesus Christ as in the notorious case of 
the Apostle Peter. The devil's main channel of influence is through the imagination of the saints. This was a common stream of thought in the Puritans. They had the same fascinated and awestruck concern with the devil, and they tended likewise to agree that his point of entry was the imagination. This is the reason he is especially successful, writes Edwards, with the melancholy, and why Edwards was constantly warning his people against that mood, particularly. It was not, however, above Satan's power to suggest ordinary ideas to ordinary persons. He's particularly active with persons in preparation for grace, seeking to be saved. The devil can simulate even the order of religious experiences, as well as tempt persons when they are under actual conviction. With saints as well as others, he can suggest biblical texts as well as their misapplication. Edwards has a good time with the way in which the devil will suggest to someone who opens the Bible at random, perhaps to Judas committing suicide, to go and do likewise and so on. He can suggest texts as well as their misapplication, though he cannot awaken men's consciences. Edwards believed that the end of the first great awakening in Northampton was affected by satanic suggestion. The devil's chief target is the godly. However, the more he attacks them, the more he advances them. His very onslaught against their Redeemer brought their redemption. Now, quote, there is no enchantment, no witchcraft can hurt them, no black art can affect their happiness. For God holds, quote, Satan on a chain. His power is a limited power. By nature, he cannot create search hearts, give life, give spiritual life, or prevent men from coming to Christ. When a person is converted, he is out of Satan's ultimate reach, for Christ is above the devil, and the devils are left with nothing to do but tremble at the wrath of God. Now a word about the creation of man, we having considered somewhat the activity of angels and devils with respect to man. He had a say, great deal to say about that, and my chapter in Rational Biblical Theology runs some 40 or so pages. However, far more is said about man through these three volumes than about angels. Their great significance is their relation to man and especially to the God-man. But it is man who is the center of the scene in the biblical redemptive history. Man was created, body and soul, is now in this world, body and soul and will, after the intermediate state in which he lives in an embodied, disembodied fashion for a time, either in heaven or in hell. But his natural state and his eternal state is as a body, soul, creature. Aquinas had already observed that the animals are mere bodies and angels are mere spirits. The distinctive characteristic of man is that like the animals, he possesses a body, and like the angels, a soul or spirit. In heaven, the resurrected body of saints, quote, will shine far brighter and appear far more beautiful than heaven itself. Nevertheless, it is reflection that raises man above beast. Edwards is very up-to-date and current in his discussion of body and soul, 
And this is, I think, would be recognized by people who concentrate on that theme in our time, that he finds that reflection is what really distinguishes man from chimpanzees. He doesn't mention chimpanzees, our closest relation apparently, but to the animal creation in general. They're not really capable of reflection, though they have some amazing powers of knowledge, as we all know. But it's this power of reflection, especially on God and the soul and immortality, of course, that raises man above beast, according to Edwards. Now, how sin, which we'll discuss more particularly, it's fall, the fall in the next lecture, but how sin has affected the mind of man is detailed in a sermon entitled, Wicked Men Are Very Inconsistent With Themselves. They are so in the following respects. I mentioned this particular sermon when we were talking about Edwards as the rational biblical theologian who sees naturally a perfect harmony between man's mind and man's piety and thought. And so here, the mark of a wicked person is discordance and tension an antithetical opposition of mind and will together, which he describes as wicked men are very inconsistent with themselves and lists nothing less than seven ways in which man has fallen is inconsistent, whereas the true, redeemed, genuine human being has a perfect consistency between his opinions, rather than having them in tension and in seeming contradiction. You remember I described that as a fundamental difference between the theology of orthodoxy of Edward's day and our day and the theology of neo-orthodoxy that prevailed in Europe and the United States in the middle of our own century. But the first of these inconsistencies that Edwards mentions, mind you, in the sermon. I said before, and I repeat again, that Edwards tried to keep technicalia out of his sermons. And you don't get any discussion of Hebrew or Greek words or anything like that in sermons, except in some comprehensive way. The toilsome labor of the study doesn't come over in his preaching, but at the same time, the substance of what he is understanding by his studies, stated in what we may call lay language, free of academic uh, technicalia and so on, is there. As you'll notice, this was a sermon preached to his congregation in a very typical, thoughtful deliverance. First, he says, the dictates of their darkened understanding are inconsistent with themselves. That is, they know one thing, but they behave differently. We're fully aware of the fact that mind is the highest characteristic of man and that that mind should be followed. But as a matter of fact, man is inconsistent with what he thinks. He behaves opposite to what he knows should be his pattern of conduct. He's inconsistent with himself at that very fundamental level. Two, their wills are inconsistent with their reason. Reason tells them they should do such and such. And in spite of that fact, they choose precisely the opposite. They think a matter through that they ought to go, for example, to church. But they actually go to a brothel. Their reason tells them that because this is the most exalted part of their being, they ought to be reading the Word of God and learning its message. Instead of that, they bury themselves in pornography. 
It outrages their intelligence. They know far better, but their behavior, their actual resolutions, utterly contrary to their mental reflections. Three, their wills are inconsistent with themselves. What he means by that is that they know that what they should do is what's going to benefit them. And to act contrary to what their intelligence dictates is going to spell their doom. What do they do? They self-destruct out of ignorance and folly, lack of training, not at all. In spite of the contrary, in spite of the fact that they know better, they commit a veritable suicide. Whether they actually kill themselves or not, they make themselves the victims of the divine wrath forever. And that is consummate follow. That should outrage their reasoned deliberations for. Their outward show is inconsistent with their hearts. Edwards had many sermons on special occasions, whether thanksgiving or an election of an official or repentance after some great uh, uh, disaster had occurred in New England or something like that, the people would gather together en masse and declare profoundly their praises of God or their deep penitence with respect to him, and it would look as if they were full of the love of God and the adoration of his excellence and committed thoroughly to total obedience to his holy will, but it's, their profession is inconsistent with their practice. They go on behaving just as they did before, and even when they are assembled, Edwards would often reflect, especially on the basis of Old Testament prophecies, that their hearts were elsewhere. It looked outwardly as if they were a very godly people gathered together in union to glorify God while individually each one was planning his own devices, engaged in his own ruminations, and his practice would show, and even then did show to the searching heart of God that it was utterly inconsistent with their profession. Six, their practice is inconsistent with their hopes. This is again a recurrent theme in the preaching of Jonathan Edwards. I know he would say to many of his people, you hope to be saved, even those of you who know you are not saved. You still don't believe that you're going to perish even though you know full well that if you die this moment, as you could very well do, you would perish in hell forever. But you can't take it seriously, even though your head tells you you ought to. You still entertain hopes that later, when you're older, or have more time for reflection, or free of certain of the urgencies of your present life or something, you'd attend to these things but their practice is inconsistent with their hopes. It's their practice which is going to destroy them even while they perish with hopes in their hearts. And finally, their practice is inconsistent with itself. Edwards wasn't the coiner of that phrase, but I gather there was an expression current in his day even I think it was among the Quakers that l this little witticism circulated especially, that the people of God pray on their knees on Sabbath and pray on their neighbors during the week. But that is what Edwards had in mind when he said that their practice was inconsistent with itself. That is, they practiced going to church, but they practiced outside of church the exact opposite of what they would have learned to do in church. Edwards was not only bipartite as to man's basic makeup, 
but he considered his mind or soul also as bipartite, consisting of thought and will. And yet he was not a faculty theologian, a psychologist. He believed the mind was one, but considered in the act of cognition was different from the mind when considered in the act of volition. He made a sharp distinction between them, but not a separation as the faculty psychologists then and now will do. Only faculty psychologists today are, tend to be called behaviorists. Here I would observe and generally writes that the notion of freedom of will as essential to moral agency and necessary to the very existence of virtue and sin in man seems to be a grand favorite point with Pelagians and Arminians and all divines, that means ministers, of such characters in their controversies with the Orthodox. There is no one thing more fundamental in their schemes of religion on the determination of this one leading point depends the issue of almost all controversies we have with such divines. I've often said that his great treatise on the freedom of the will, uh, inquiry concerning the freedom of the will, his heaviest work, profoundest work, the work which led Perry Miller of Harvard to say if Edwards had never written anything but that, he would still be the greatest philosopher, theologian ever to grace the American scene. And that work is what I call an evangelistic tract. It was written in a way that demolished wrong theory on the part of the greatest theorists but at the same time, it was written to try to preserve the Christian religion and the fundamental doctrines of it because this specious false thinking that characterizes, he says, Pelagians and Arminians and was creeping into New England and undermining her foundation, he reduced to absolute absurdity. He pointed out on almost every page of that volume that this was a ridiculous contradiction in terms that made no sense whatever, and yet it was being used to overthrow the foundations of the Christian religion. No, no, the reason and the will should be in harmony, and the will should always choose, and does choose, even in the wicked, a perverted notion of what the truth is if they do not have the proper Notion. The Holy Spirit dwelt in man as created, Edwards points out. Created man could and did lose that superadded gift by not calling on the Holy Spirit. But how could man lose the Spirit of God? He did, according to Jonathan Edwards, and I don't have time here to explain it, but I'll just say this much in closing this particular lecture that this has always been perhaps the greatest problem in Christian theology for the orthodox and unorthodox as far as that is concerned. How a man created upright in the image of God could choose evil. Well, in medieval thought, they fancy there was an antagonism between the body and the soul and God gave this super added gift to keep them in harmony, but Adam refused that. Now, Edwards gives no evidence of thinking of a super added gift, and nor does he feel any intrinsic contradiction or tension between body and mind, but he doesn't dispute the biblical evidence that men created upright did fall, and he traces it to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God was necessary to direct the otherwise self-interested concerns of men toward God, and that Adam actually alienated the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit withdrew, man, left to his own devices and concerned legitimately with his own interest, nevertheless, exalted those interests, which were legitimate enough in themselves, above 
the divine interest and brought, of course, absolute ruin upon himself because of the wickedness of such an activity, and thus man fell, according to Jonathan Edwards.